Today, we're going to be talking about scientific publications. Exciting. We're going to make it exciting. It sounds boring, but we are making it exciting. Scientific publications are just a way for scientists to talk about their research. Scientists need to tell each other about what they're doing. They need to share their findings with each other, right? Based on this concept of cumulative knowledge, we're trying to work with what each other has done and build off it. And we're doing that because it means that we are getting closer to how the world actually works. This cumulative approach requires consistent communication. There's basically three main ways that we communicate our science with each other as scientists. There's peer-reviewed articles, there are conferences and the proceedings that are published after conferences, and then there's also a few less formal methods which I've kind of grouped together into one umbrella. So we're going to be going through all of those three different types and I hope that I can teach you a little bit about them. Journal articles. What is a journal article? It's an article in a fancy magazine for scientists. That's it. That's all they are. Most of them aren't even like printed anymore. They're just online. So it's literally just a website. But some of them are. Some of them you can still get delivered for a rather expensive amount of money. Let's just say they tend to be in the hundreds um, for a regular issue. Let's think about the process of getting your research published in a journal. First thing you need to do is finish your research. You can't go away and publish unfinished research, although that is starting to change. You want to write up a report. So in your report, you want to explain why you did your research. You want to explain how you did your research, what you sampled. If it's people, you want to describe the people that you sampled, who took part in your study. If not, you want to describe things like chemical properties of the materials that you were working with. You want to describe the methods that you used. So that is the way that you ran your study. So how exactly you did it, things like equipment that you used or questionnaires. And then you want to write up about your results. Ideally, you need to write what your results are in terms of your statistical analyses that you ran on your data set, and then what that actually means in relation to your hypothesis. We're gonna get back to that in a second. So you've got your report. What are you doing with it now? You are submitting it to a journal. Journals basically are fancy web portals these days. You just sit there and you type in, here is my name, here is my university affiliation, here is my manuscript in the form of a Word document or a PDF or something like that. If the editor looks at it and thinks like, yes, this article fits in our journal well, so it fits the topic, it matches the theme, um, it uses the right methodology, it gets sent out for peer review. And we're going to talk about peer review a bit in a second. After it's been peer reviewed, the article is either accepted or rejected, or sometimes they will accept with amendments. So you have to make a few changes. And if it's accepted in any way and you've made the changes and they're approved, congratulations, your article is now queued for publication. Peer review is a really key concept that you need to understand when we're talking about any kind of scientific publication. And that's because the vast majority of scientific research is peer reviewed eventually. This includes journal articles overwhelmingly, but also some conferences. Peer-reviewed articles are normally considered more prestigious just because it means that they've had their validity and quality checked. So it means another scientist, or often it's multiple, so it might be two or three, they've gone through your work and they've had a look at it and they've gone, yeah, this is all right. This is pretty good. This is worth publishing. The person that reviews your manuscript would generally be an expert in the topic or with the methodology that you used in your research. In theory, they should know what they are talking about when they review it. The kind of main goal is to identify errors in the work. So for example, the theory that you're using doesn't actually fit with what you're doing. Statistical errors, just your numbers are slightly wrong somewhere. And then coding errors is increasingly becoming a thing too. It's not as much of a thing in the psychology that I do, but there are some very heavily computational fields of psychology where your coding errors can cause big problems. Peer review does help with checking the validity and quality of scientific work, but ultimately it relies on people. And whenever there's people involved, there's potential for bias. So for example, if you're a scientist, you might think to yourself, oh, these universities are really prestigious. Whereas you might look at another university and be like, I've never heard of it. And that in itself could bias how you think about a paper that has been submitted for review. You could think, well, the paper that has come from a prestigious university, that must be good. It must be good research. I know they do good research. Whereas if if you're looking at a paper from, from a research institute that you've never heard of before, then you might think, well, I've never heard of them, so they can't be that good. To try and overcome the biases that can arise from peer review, we use varying levels of anonymity. Single blind reviews are when the identity of the reviewer is hidden from the author. So you will receive a manuscript to be reviewed and you know who's written it, 
but they don't know who is reviewing it. And that's the way it's been done for a really, really long time. But then we realized, hang on, if we're seeing who has written the paper, then there is the chance for that bias to creep in. A lot of journals then started doing double blind reviews. That's where neither the reviewer or the author know who the other one is. So that means I will submit a paper. I don't know who's reviewing it and they don't know who I am. They don't know who's written it. An alternative type of peer review is transparent peer review where everything is shared publicly. Normally it would be double blind to start with and then everything is released at the end. So everybody knows who was involved and that's starting to become slightly more common but it's not super common in psychology yet. Even though we've got these methods of peer review, that doesn't guarantee that the article that goes through peer review is going to end up being a good one. Something might get approved after peer review and still have really serious errors. There's a whole bunch of reasons for this. First of all, scientists are super busy, especially the ones that work in universities. They do not have much time at all. They are having to churn out research. We have this thing that we call publish or perish culture, where we basically just have to get out as many publications as possible to further our career. Our careers are very much centered around like how much we publish and how much we share our research. That's normally the main thing that's used to decide whether or not you get promoted. For early career researchers like me, it's the determining factor of whether or not I'll get like a postdoc or if I could end up being a lecturer. So it's like that and then grant money. Those are the two main things. But that means that scientists might not have the time to go through and check everything that they need to. So for example, a really common issue is that some scientists will send their work for peer review and they'll include a data set with it. They will look at the article and they will just assume that what's in the article will match up with what's in the data set. But if they open up the data set and have a look at the statistical outputs and see how it's been analyzed, they might notice some things wrong with it. The other issue is that sometimes the reviewers don't have the methodological expertise to check all aspects of the paper. And in psychology, that's particularly an issue with computer code. We might know all about the, say for example, the social phenomenon that's being studied, but we don't understand the code that's simulating it. Well, then how can we really look at it and say like, yes, this is a good paper. We understand the conceptual side of it, but not how it's actually been implemented. And if there's big chunks missing like that, it can be really difficult to do a thorough peer review. But all of these issues do mean that sometimes errors and bad research practices, and sometimes even fraud can appear in the scientific record. There's been quite a few high profile cases where somebody was just lying. They were just, they just made up their data or they were changing their data. And then they got it published as though it was actual research. It's kind of wild. To really help you understand how articles work, I'm going to go through this example paper and highlight the key sections that you would find in a kind of standard psychology paper. The title of this paper is Belongingness as a Mediator of the Relationship Between Felt Stigma and Identification in Fans. I chose it because it talks about anime fans. I won't be talking about all of the title and what the numbers in the top left corner mean and all of that stuff because it's just a way of identifying the journal, to be honest. Um, the important bits that you would be interested in reading are the actual sections in the paper. Normally the first thing that you'll see in any paper is the abstract, which is just a short 150 to 250 word overview of the whole paper. It's normally going to be plonked right on the first page alongside the title and the names and keywords. And all of that is meant to help you go through the paper very quickly, just open it up, read the abstract very, very quickly and understand whether it's relevant to what you need. It looks like in this abstract, they're summarizing what they're doing in the study. They're summarizing the findings and then they've got a sentence saying what this means for the wider research area. And that's a pretty standard recipe that you will see in most abstracts. So you can really get a solid sense of what the paper is about and its contents just by very briefly skimming this. However, do not rely on it. Most of the detail is not there. Abstracts are always free, but you may or may not have to pay for the full paper depending on the publisher. Some journals, they will just publish everything openly. So they call that open access. The authors pay a charge. When I say the authors, normally it's their university actually pays the charge but sometimes it is the authors, unfortunately. It depends on how much funding they've got. Traditional closed access models for publications, normally the authors will pay a small fee. However, you will then pay a fee to access it. So it will be put on their website behind a paywall and you've got to pay to get into it. If you're affiliated with a university, they will have a subscription and that will let you get into the article via your university. If you're just an independent person vibing, you just want to read the paper, you're going to have to pay and it's normally quite expensive. I think the most expensive one I've seen was like a hundred dollars. Normally for psychology journals, they're in the kind of like 30 to 50 range. The 
introduction section of a paper just summarizes all of the previous research on a topic. So you're trying to tell the story of why you're researching this thing and you're trying to explain how your research is new and important. You're also going to try and get across your study's aims and hypotheses. So a hypothesis is just a statement which specifies the relationship that you're testing. In this paper by Tegan and colleagues, they talk about how fan groups can feel stigmatized. So for example, anime fans. The next part in any paper is going to be the method section. It describes the sample, so who took part, the procedure, what you did in your research, and any measures or stimuli that you've used. So how you have done your research. As a scientist, I would look at the method section if I want to replicate the study and if I want to understand what they've done. So it needs to be decently detailed. So in this example, they've included things like how many people took part, the gender breakdown, the age breakdown, whether they were students or not, and then also what fan interest groups that they were part of. After you've detailed your method, there's going to be a results section. So the results section describes what the statistics tell us about our hypotheses. In your results section, you want to say what those relationships were expected to be and then what they actually are. Now, the results section can have a lot of statistics and numbers in it. It is normally the most technical part of the paper. It's also the part of the paper that I hate the most because there's too many numbers. But good papers will try and visualize these numbers into diagrams. An example here, they've got this really complicated model. It's doing all kinds of wacky stuff. It visualizes it so you can kind of have some degree of understanding of what's happening. We've got the felt stigma, we've got meaning, and then we've got fandom. So from this, we can roughly work out that there is some kind of positive relationship between feelings of stigma and meaning that they attach to something. And then there is no relationship between meaning and the fandom that they're in. If you've actually read the method section, you'd know what all of those words mean. I didn't read the method section because I have not got time for that. That is effort. I am tired. Uh, normally the last section of a paper would be the discussion section. So the discussion section just describes what the results mean in kind of more simpler language. They talk about whether the results reflect your hypothesis or whether you found something else. But then it also talks about those findings in relation to existing theories. So how your findings support or contradict them. In the example that we're looking at here, they give a very brief summary of all of the findings. And then they go on to explain how those findings link to different models. For example, the rejection identification model. When you get to the end of the paper and the writing's all finished, you'll come across the reference section. So references are really important because they show your thinking. They show the sources that you drew upon to map out your study and when looking at how your study fits in with the existing literature. So you have to list all of the sources that you've used in your work. Different fields have different styles of doing this. The example that I've got up right now is APA style, and that's what we tend to use in psychology. Journal articles are all well and good, but another way that we share our research is at conferences. These are basically just science conventions. I have no other way to describe them. They're just anime conventions, but for scientists. We talk about science instead of anime, that's it. Conferences have a little bit of a weird narrative around them in anime. So the top left, I think, is from Steins Gate, but the visual novel. The bottom right is from a certain scientific railgun. In both of those examples, conferences are portrayed as this creepy place where scientists go and they either do something sus or they share concerning ideas or they get rejected and then that turns them down the mad evil scientist path. As somebody who has had three people turn up to a talk that I've done, I can confirm it does send you down the creepy evil scientist path. What actually happens at these conferences? They're just science conventions. Loads of scientists will come together to present their research and network with each other. They're normally centered around a specific field. So for example, I might go to a social psychology conference. There's pretty much a conference for every single sub-discipline under the sun. So sometimes when you submit something to a conference, it will be peer reviewed, but sometimes it's not. It really just varies according to the discipline. I've been to conferences that do both. I think that the peer review seems to be more common in things like computer science, where you submit a paper and then it gets published in the conference proceedings, which is basically just a fancy journal that they do afterwards. But psychology doesn't normally do that. We normally just go and talk about the research and meet other people that are doing similar research and get feedback on what we're doing. It tends to be work in progress at psychology conferences rather than fully formed projects. There may also be partying. There's a whole bunch of different types of conference talks that people can do. There's keynote lectures, which are normally about an hour long, and it's just a famous person 
coming along and giving a talk on a topic of their choice. Often it's when they're getting to the end of their career or if it's if they've had a big career achievement recently. But to be honest, it's more of a clout thing than anything else. There is standard talks. They're normally roughly 15 minutes and there'll be a verbal overview of one of the research papers or projects that you're involved in. They're normally organized into themed sessions called symposia, but not always. Every now and then you'll have things that do not belong together whatsoever. It's very strange. You can sit there and you're like, okay, now I'm listening to a talk about how children develop, you know, how they, how they socialize. And now I'm listening to a talk about why people in the Balkans hate each other. And now I'm listening to a talk about how we process emotions. And now I'm listening to a talk about why we believe in conspiracy theories. Brilliant. None of that belonged together whatsoever, but it's all in one session. It's very cool. We love that. There's also posters, which are basically just a giant printout summarizing either one study or a set of studies. They're fairly common for PhD students to do, but sometimes you'll see professors doing them too. They're a lot more chill than giving a talk. If you do a talk, you're kind of expected to be like professional and you're often recorded. So you have to, you know, actually prepare. Um, <laughs> whereas a poster, you make the poster, you put it up on a board, you stand there and you can do like a two minute elevator pitch, but then otherwise it's just kind of casual like questions and answers. I really prefer them to be honest, because normally the rooms are really busy and you can just kind of disappear into the background if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed. Whereas if you're doing a talk, you're like front and center. And if you're getting stage fright, then that's it. It's happening. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit much. Every now and then conferences will also have different types of sessions. So for example, data blitz, where you've got five minutes to very quickly summarize all of the research that you've done. You power through it, that's it, you're done. There's also panels like in anime conventions. <laughs> Everything else. Psychologists have been embracing slightly less formal methods of sharing their research. Preprints are just self-published articles which haven't been peer reviewed yet. They are really, really common in other types of science. So I know they're super common in like biology and medicine. They're really, really common in computer science and in astronomy and astrophysics and physics in general. Psychology is only just starting to pick up on them really. They are way more popular than they used to be because they're really, really good for getting feedback. You can send them out to people that you know and you can say, can I have a little bit of feedback on this work? What do you think about it? And then you're basically getting peer reviewed before you even submit to a journal. But also so it gets time stamped. So there's a little bit of an issue or maybe more of a fear in science, which is scooping. That's the idea that somebody might come along and take your research idea and do it before you can. And then they publish first and that's it. And then you, you have to cite them going forward. But if you preprint your work, then it means that you have a timestamp saying, I have already thought of this. I am putting it online. And if somebody else then goes away and scoops your idea and tries to get it published, they then have to reference your preprint. Psychologists are also really embracing things like podcasts. There are actually quite a few long form content type of podcasts where they just discuss academic topics or academic papers in a lot of detail. I listen to a few of them. They're actually really useful. If I don't have the time to like go away and read a paper, I can just listen to two people talking about the paper instead. And it's really helpful. And then scientists up until very, very recently were massively on Twitter. Scientists really love Twitter for sharing ideas and links to things like preprints and then getting feedback. A lot of them are now moving to Blue Sky and Mastodon. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the talk. That's it. I'm done.